Welcome to Van's reading. We're on part three of rule eight, Beyond Order. Let's begin. One room. I live with my wife in a small semi-detached house with a living room that cannot be larger than 12 feet by 12 feet. But we work to make that room extremely beautiful while endeavoring to do the same with the rest of the house. In the living room hung some large paintings, not, not to everyone's taste, certainly. They were Soviet realists, impressionist pieces, some illustrating the Second World War, or Second World War, some representing the triumph of communism, as well as a variety of Cubist miniatures and South American pieces heavily influenced. By the native tradition prior to our recent renovations, the room had held at least 25 paintings, including about 15 small, smaller pieces, 12 feet by 12. There was one reminiscent of medieval etching, although painted on canvas on the ceiling where I had attached it with magnets. It was from a Romanian, from a Romanian church. The largest was six high and about eight feet wide. Six, sorry, the largest was six foot high and about eight feet wide. I know perfectly well that aggregating all these paintings together in such a small contra uh, in a small space contradicts my earlier points about devoting a room or even a building to a single work of art, but I have only a single house, so I plead necessity. If I wanted to collect paintings, they had to be put where I was able to put them. In the rest of the house, we used 36 different colors and a variety of different glosses and a variety of different glosses on the walls and the trim throughout the building, all from a palette that matched a large realist painting of a railway yard in Chicago in the 1950s, created by the same artist who helped us plan then and then renovate our home. I bought the Soviet pieces on eBay from a Ukrainian junk dealer specializing in Soviet era artifacts at one point. I had a network of about 20 people in the Ukraine sending me photographs of whatever paintings they had scrounged from the ruins of the Soviet bureaucracy. Most were awful, but some were amazing. I have a great painting, for example, of Yuri Gagarin, the first man in space standing in front of a rocket and a radar installation, and another from the 1970s of a lonesome soldier writing his mother in front of a large radio. It is really something to see relatively modern events memorialized in oil by talented artists. The Soviet kept their academies functioning continuously from the 19th century onward, and although tremendous restrictions were placed on what could be produced, those who passed through them became highly skilled painters. The Soviet paintings eventually uh, took over our house. Most of them were small and in insanely expensive, and I thought, and I bought dozens of them. The Soviet era produced its own impressionism, often depicting landscapes rougher and harsher than the classic French versions, but much to my taste and reminiscent of where I grew up in Western Canada. While seeking them out, I exposed myself to larger number of paintings, I like to think, than anyone else in history, for at least four years starting in 2001. I searched eBay looking, and looking at roughly a thousand paintings a day. So that's a thousand pictures of paintings times 300 days per year by four, equals 1.2 million paintings. That has to be some sort of record, not that it matters, but it's comical to consider mostly because I do not think it would have been possible to see that many paintings before internet technology made massive database, database possible. possible. I don't believe that. I don't believe he fucking did that. Sorry for my language, but I don't believe that. I searched eBay looking at the roughly a thousand paintings a day, seeking the one or two in that number that were of genuine quality. It was most often Russian or Soviet landscapes selling for a song better paintings than I had ever seen in galleries or m museums collections in Toronto. I would place them in a list of items I was interested in and eBay future print them out, lay them on the floor and then ask my wife Tammy to help me narrow my choices. She has a good eye and a fair bit of training as an artist. We would discard anything we found to be flawed and purchase what remained because of this. My kids grew up surrounded by art and it certainly left an impression. Many of my paintings now hang in their respective dwellings. They tend to avoid the more political Soviet propaganda, which I was interested in because of its historical significance and because of the ongoing war on the canvases between art, a consequence of the painter's undeniable talent and the propaganda that art was doomed to serve. I can tell you that the art shines through the propaganda as the years pass by, that is something very interesting to observe. Could you imagine like Michaela's friends coming over and just like seeing Russian, you know, 
stuff around the pot, the house, just like, dun, dun. like I could hear the music coming from each painting, like already, like in my mind, I just see or she bringing her friends. Hey guys, want to come to my house? And they just come inside and then they like, look at this like Russian, what the hell is this communist doing in Canada? <laughs> just, that would be really funny to watch in like in a movie or something. And then just like play some Russian music like her friends who are like, oh my God, I'm Canadian, I'm French, I speak French a bit, but I'm not that French. And then they go in and that would be so freaking funny. And they just come in and it's like, Michaela, I didn't know your dad was Russian. That would have been uh, yeah, maybe a good FYI for me. Uh, um, yeah, I didn't know he loved Stalin so much. <laughs> oh boy. Uh, I also tried about uh, that time to make my university office beautiful. After I was transferred from an office, I had already put some work into the same artist to help redesign the interior of our house and from whom I, whom I also purchased many large paintings, which were also hang in our house, tried to help me transform my new factory like fluorescent lit catastrophe of a 1970s sealed window how hole office into something that someone with some sense could sit in for 30 years without wanting to die. Faculty, rem faculty members were forbidden to undertake any major modifications to these spaces due to union requirements or administration's interpretations of those requirements. So my artist friend and I devised an alternative plan. We decided to insert some heavy nickel plated hooks into the cinder block in pairs about four feet apart and seven feet above the ground and then to hang from those hooks good three quarter inch sanded and stained wood sheets with cherry veneer on one side, voila, wood paneled office for the cost of about, cost of about eight, seven, eight seventy five dollar pieces of plywood plus some labor. We were going to install these on a weekend when there was no one else around. Then we planned to paint the drop ceilings carefully as ap asper or as asbestos, I think asbestos lurked above the tiles, asbestos. Sorry, carefully as, as asbestos looked above the tiles. Hull is a place of drop ceilings, rusted ventilation grates and fluorescent lights, the dismissal, ugliness and dreariness and general depression of spirit that results from these cost saving features, no doubt suppresses pr productivity far more than the cheapest of architectural tricks and the most deadening of lights save, saves money. Everyone looks like a corpse under fluorescence. Pennywise and pound and pound foolish indeed. We were going to paint the ceiling with a paint called ham hammerite, which looks like beaten metal once it dries. That would have transformed the un the unavoidable industrial aesthetic, which can be attractive if handled wisely into something thoughtful and unique. This could also have been done for a minimal cost. A good carpet, perhaps Persian, also very inexpensive on eBay. Some reasonably high quality curtains and a descent industrial desk, one weekend of secretive work and an office that a civilized person could inhabit without resentment and self-contempt. But I made a fatal error. I spoke to one of the senior administrators of the psychology department about my plans. She and I had previously discussed the sheer ugliness of the floor our area inhabited and the dismissal state of all the offices. And I thought we had established consensus that improvement was warranted. Okay, this chapter is going nowhere. Uh, I mean, the rule here at the end of part, I mean, whatever. I assumed she was on board. We had even talked about transforming her corner office. I began excitedly share my intention. She looked displeased instead of happy and said unexpectedly, you cannot do that. You cannot do that. I shook my head in disbelief and thought, what? I am I am planning to make something exceedingly ugly better quickly with no trouble for no money to speak of. And your response is, you cannot do that. I said, what do you mean? She said, well, if you do it, everyone else will want to do it. Four responses flashed through my mind. Uh, one, no, they, sh they would not. No, they would not. Two, everyone could do it because it would be dirt cheap. Three, I thought we were sane adults having a productive conversation about improving something important in a university, but we are actually children squabbling in a kindergarten playground. Four, I thought I was speaking with someone sane and reasonable, but I was clearly, clearly wrong. She finished the conversation with a direct threat. Do not push me on this stupid me. I asked for permission. Not really. I was trying to communicate something motivating, beautiful and exciting. 
but it boiled down to a power game. I shared none of my four responses. However, although I was sorely tempted to voice all of them and immediately recalibrated my strategy, my artist friend and I were already more than convers conversant with the essentially insanity and intransigence. Uh, oh, this is a tough word. And intransigence. Intrans I think intransigence. Intransigence? Intransigence of mid-level bureaucracies. I, think I can't say this. Intranscend in transcendence in of mid-level bureaucracies so we had already dreamed up a less expansive plan b this involved the careful choosing of paint for the walls rather than the much preferable wood with some accent painting where there was where that was possible and matching carpets and drapery i still had to fight the administration to get the precise colors i had chosen which suited the industrial feel of the office but won the battle Won that battle. Plan B was not as good as a plan. As Plan B was not as good as Plan A, but it was still much better than the status quo. Later, I added a drop. I added a dropped copper ceiling using lightweight adhesive plastic tiles that mimic decorative metal quite accurately. Hung a few paintings and added a couple of suitable statues. Students, colleagues, and visitors. Sorry, let me repeat that. Students, colleagues, and visitors come in and do a double take. My office is a place of creativity and beauty and not a bloody, horrible, fluorescent lit factory. Visitors are surprised, therefore surprised, relieved and pleased. Not long after, I discovered that the department was now bringing potential new hires into my office to show them what kind of creative freedom was possible at the University of Toronto. I thought that was insanely comical. I thought about all of that for a long time. The resistance I encountered was somewhat incom incomprehensible in its strength i wondered god people seem god people seem to be afraid of what i'm doing in this office perhaps there is a reason an important reason i do not understand then i came across a story by the biologist robert sapolsky it was our wild it was our wildebeest wildebeests are herd animals and very difficult to distinguish from one another maybe not for other wildebeests but certainly for those who wish to study them they blend together at one point in the past this presented a serious problem to biologists needing to observe individual animals for enough time to derive some conclusions about their behavior they would watch a wildebeest look away for a moment to make notes and be unable to locate the same animal when they glanced back up eventually they settled a they settled on a potential solution. The biologist drove up adjacent to the herd in a jeep armed with a bucket of red paint and a stick with a rag on it. They, dabbled, they dabbed a red spot on one of the wildebeest's haunches. Now they could track the activities of the particular animal and hopefully learn something new about wildebeest behavior. But guess what happened to the wildebeest now differentiated from the herd? The predators always lurking around the herd took it down. Lions, a major wildebeest threat, cannot easily bring a single wildebeest down unless they can identify it. They cannot hunt a blur of indistinguishable herd animals. They cannot track down four wildebeests at a time. They must organize their hunt around an, identifi an identifiable individual. Thus, when lions go after the little ones or the ones that limp, they are not culling the weak in some natural display of beneficial altruism. They would rather dine on a nice, healthy, delicious, juicy wildebeest than one that is tiny and old or ill. But they must be able to identify their prey. What is the moral of the story? Make yourself colorful, stand out, and the lions will take you down. And the lions are always there. Fuck. That is true. That is, those lions are going to come and take me. If I ever become, you know, something. But I got to be ready, man. I got everybody got to be ready. You know what I mean? Because that's the truth. Uh, I mean, look at everybody getting canceled. And like, that's just the way it is. Lions, you know, lions are always there. And I think that's a big thing. If you stick your neck out, then the sword will come. Many, many cultures have a saying like that. The English version, the poppy that grows higher than the rest is the first one to have its head removed by the scythe. In Japan, the nail that sticks up above the rest is the first to get hit by the hammer. This is a non-trivial observation, hence its commonality. Artistic creative endeavor is a high risk. While the probability of return is low, but the probability of exceptionally high return does exist. 
and creative endeavor, while dangerous and unlikely to be successful, is also absolutely vital to the transformation that enables us to keep our footing. Everything changes. Pure traditionalism is doomed for that very reason. We need the new merely to maintain our position, and we need to see what we have become blinded to by our very expertise and specialization so that we do not lose touch with the kingdom of God and die in our boredom, ennui, arrogance, blindness to beauty, and soul-deadening cynicism. 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 Plus, we are helpless prey animals cowering and protecting ourselves, hiding and camouflaging, or, or are we human beings? Not decoration. People are often upset by... I don't know what the whole point was. Sorry, apologies, but I didn't understand that last sentence. Let me just repeat. We need the new merely to maintain our position, and we need to see what we have become blinded to by our very expertise and specialization so that we do not lose touch with the kingdom, the kingdom of God and die in our boredom, in a way, arrogance, blindness to beauty, and soul-deadening cynicism. Plus, we are helpless prey animals, cowering and protecting ourselves, hiding and camouflaging, or are we human beings? I, get, I think I understand. He's trying to say, are we just, should we act as if we were animals, or are we human beings? And I think that's a good question right there. Uh, not decoration. People are often upset by abstract art or by art that appears to devote itself to producing ne negative reactions such as disgust or horror merely for the shock value. I have a tremendous respect for ideals of traditional beauty and therefore some, sim some sympathy for that response. And there is little doubt that many who merely disdain tradition mask the sentiment with artistic pretension. However, the passage of time Dif uh, of time differentiates truly inspired work from the fraudulent sort, even if imperfectly and what is not crucial is generally left behind. It is easy to make the opposite error as well that art should be pretty and easily appreciated without work or challenge. It should be decorative. It should match the living room furniture, but art is not decoration. That is the attitude of a naive beginner or someone who will not let their terror of art allow them to progress and learn. Sorry, I just need to read that again because it's interesting. It is easy to make opposite error as well. That art should be pretty and easily appreciated without work or challenge. It should be decorative. It should match the living room furniture, but art is not decoration. That is the attitude of a naive beginner or of someone who will not let their terror of art allow them to progress and learn. Art is exploration. Artists train people to see. Most people with any exposure, exposure to art now regard the work of the Impressionists, for example, as both self-evidently beautiful and relatively traditional. This is in no small part because we will all perceive the world now, at least in part, in the manner that only Impressionists could manage in the latter half of the 19th century. We cannot help doing so because the Impressionist aesthetic has saturated, has saturated everything, advertisement, movies, popular posters, comic books, phot photographs, all forms of visual art. Now we all see the beauty of light and that only the Impressionists could once apprehend. They taught us this, but when the Impressionists first displayed their paintings in the Salon de Refouet of 1863, uh, as the traditional Paris Salon had rejected them, the pieces were met with laughter and contempt. The idea of perceiving that way, paying particular attention to light, essentially rather than form, was so radical that it caused people to have emotional fits. I am often struck I'm often struck by how common even the tropes of cubism, much more extreme and strange in some ways than impressionism, have become part of have become part and parcel of our visual vernacular. I've seen the multidimensional but flattened faces of the genre, the genre, the genre, the genre, the genre. I think that's how you say. It. Oh yeah, I said genre, genre. I have seen the multidimensional but flattened faces of the genre even in com in comic books. The same is true of surrealism, which has become popular, uh, which has become popularly integrated almost to the point of cliche. It is worth repeating. Artists teach. It's, it is worth repeating. Artists teach people to see. It is very hard to perceive the world, and we are so fortunate to have geniuses to teach us how to do it, to reconnect us with what we have lost, and to enlighten us to the world. It is for such psychological reasons that lines such as Christ can be profitably considered. At the time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? He called the little, 
he called a little child to him and placed a child among them. And, and he said, truly, I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Uh, Matthew 18, verse 1 to 3. Beauty leads you back to what you have lost. Beauty reminds you of what remains forever immune to cynicism. Beauty beckons in a manner that straightens your aim. Beauty reminds you that there is lesser and greater value. Many things make life worth living, love, play, courage, gratitude, work, friendship, truth, grace, hope, virtue, and responsibility. But beauty is among the greatest of these. What thou the radiance which was once so bright, be now forever taken from my sight. Thou nothing can bring back the hour of splendor in the grass, of glory in the flower. We will grieve not, rather find strength in what remains behind. In the primal sympathy which have which having been must ever be in the soothing thoughts that spring out of human suffering the faith that looks through death in years that bring the philosophic the philosophic mind actually, i actually want to do that again just if someone takes this out of you know video if one day you, ne you never know uh let me repeat this poem what the the radiance which was once so bright be now forever taken from my sight Thou nothing can bring back the hour of splendor in the grass, of glory in the flower. We will grieve not, rather find strength in what remains behind. In the primal sympathy which, have, which having been must ever be, in the soothing thoughts that spring out of human suffering. In the faith that looks through death in years that bring the philosophic mind. William Woods, the ode intimations of immortality from recollections of early childhood try to make one room in your home as beautiful as possible okay that was interesting that's the end of rule eight part three and rule eight itself what have you learned i think what you've learned is why is beauty needed i think he's trying to say that beauty is something of it, it it actually yeah the, the truth behind you is that it defines what is less and what is more and i think maybe that's what art teaches us in a way as well and what and what we tend to ignore uh, oh that rhymes art teaches what is there and what we tend to ignore oh that's so good uh i'm becoming a poet it seems by reading this poetry but yeah uh very interesting uh point there I think, yeah, like I said in the previous videos, art is a guidance. It's more of an inspiration. It's more of a inviting. It's creating feelings uh, from, you know, maybe past, uh, past emotions, past memories, <clears throat> and it's super interesting to see what inspires us when you go to an art gallery you're like oh what is this crap am i looking at but then you look at it and you're like what what does this make me feel well, you i mean should you ask that question or maybe you see something that makes you you know something that you, why you shouldn't be forcing something maybe certain art pieces work with some people and some with you know some don't right but for me you know, it depends on the art, definitely, whatever. Like, but I think you shouldn't be just comparing it just to art. You should be comparing it to videos. You should be comparing it to movies. You should be comparing it to songs. You should be comparing. And I think that's a good, you know, I think what he's trying to say is life is beauty and that we should intend to enjoy it, not just suffer it, you know. And I think that's a, I think that's a good um yeah, good way to end the video. I think that's pretty good. Anyway, thanks for watching. It's a little bit of a short, you know, short summary on it, but whatever. I mean, it does, the, the chapter was a bit um, dry, I have to admit, but a very honest and good point. He could have s literally finished in five sentences that whole chapter. Let's be frank. Um, very interesting. Uh, as I said, interesting, interesting. But yeah, thanks for watching. And see you in the next one. And if you watch till the end of the videos, you're crazy and I love you. <laughs> but anyway, thanks for watching. Uh, have a good day.